I've got something fun coming up for Sunday school and uh, not going to be able to get to it this morning. I don't think we'll be able to get to it this morning, but it's, it's stuff I like to study. Um, I think, I think that science and the right kind of science is biblical. When they say the science is, the, the Bible's not a science textbook, I would, I would respectfully disagree with that because I think that contained in the Word of God are the blueprints for everything that He made. Because He spoke those things into existence and um, I believe the, the spoken Word is the Bible and the Bible is the Word. Um, we know that by Jesus all things were made and without him was not anything made that was made. And so I think if you I think if you look close enough, you'll see the creation and how everything works. I think you'll see it in the Bible. And uh, what's what's bringing this up is we're in Second Corinthians 12. So or Second Corinthians 11, we're getting into Second Corinthians 12. And this is um, where the Apostle Paul speaks of. Someone that he knew that was, was transported into the third heaven. And um, so if you, if, you know, if you know a little bit about the universe that we live in and you know, you know the correlation in the Bible, you'll, you can define what those three heavens are um, According to the Word of God, the Word of God's always right, and then according to certain certain scientific facts, I am not anti-science, and I'm not a, I'm not afraid when it comes to things that scientists learn as time goes on. Of course, we know science sometimes is always in a state of flux because things that they thought. 40 years ago, they don't think anymore. They've had to kind of rewrite and, and change some things. But when you, when you look at some of the discoveries that science has made, you can see that those things were recorded for us already in the Bible. The water table, for an example. Solomon wrote about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And that was knowledge that was way beyond the time in which he lived because no one really understood how the rivers ran into the sea and yet the sea was not full they knew that but they didn't know how it worked and so solomon describes it exactly and so i'm not uh, science doesn't scare me when you realize that god is a the word science means knowledge and god is a god of knowledge and um of course some people take this way too far on both on both extremes so uh, probably next Sunday, or we may even get to it this morning, we'll look at what the Bible says about the three heavens and how they're, how they're seen and how they're defined uh, by way of the scriptures. But we've been studying 2 Corinthians 11 uh, for about the last, what, four or five years, something like that. We've been stuck here. Uh, first, we started talking about uh, the beginning of the chapter, uh, the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel that Paul warned about. Then we move down to uh, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no mar marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And so we've been studying... Uh, the the person of Satan, who he is, what he is, um, what his powers are, what his limitations are, uh, what he can and cannot do according to the scriptures, what he wants to do versus what God is going to allow him to do. And we've gotten to the point now to where we're looking at his overthrow, his demise. Does Satan, 
Is he going to get away with all of his schemes and all of his plans? And of course, the answer is no. Uh, are those that follow Satan, because some say that they follow Satan because Satan has promised them a kingdom. Well, I'm sure he, I'm sure he has. One of the things you learn about the devil is that he is a great promiser and he is not a good fulfiller of those promises. He's a liar. He'll make all kinds of nice little uh, promises to people, promise them fulfillment, promise them power, promise them things, and he's a liar. He, he's, the one that, he's the one that wrote your best life now. If anybody wrote that book, it would be the devil. Your best life now. So, um, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, And no marvel of Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is great, no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end, here it is, whose end shall be according to their works. Look in Colossians chapter 2, turn there. That's what I have on the screen, but I want you to turn there in your Bibles. And uh, we're going to kind of back up just a little bit as we move forward. And we're going to learn how the devil is defeated. Colossians chapter 2, turn there. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 the Bible says, you being, dead in, uh, you being dead in your sins and in this uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, good morning, Donna, having, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, that's what we're studying on Sunday night. We're looking at the kingdom of devils. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What does it mean when it, the Bible says it made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it? Uh, take your Bible, turn to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. You have a foreshadowing of the cross, I believe. Uh, you have the story in Judges 16, you have the story of Samson. And you have Delilah. Delilah is playing the part of mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Uh, she has been hired by the Philistines to find out what's the key to Samson's power. And what was... Just, just to ask you this morning, what was the source of Samson's great strength and power? What was that? His, his hair. And what was it about his hair? Okay, keep going. It was, how many locks? Seven. Why? Seven spirits of God. Because Jesus in Revelation 5, he is seen as the lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. And those seven horns and those seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. So picture Samson with those seven locks. They are the seven horns that are on Jesus and they represent the seven spirits of God. So what is Delilah, what does Mystery Babylon do what does she succeed in doing in denominations, ministries, churches all over the world? She succeeds in removing the church's source of power and strength, which is the Spirit and the Word of God. When you take the Word of God out of a church, you have to replace it with something. So they replace it with coffee shops, they replace it with uh, rock and roll music, they replace it with fog machines on the stage and light shows and sometimes they'll have dancing women up on the stage and they'll have uh, these, these 
odd, lascivious sermons like Thursday on Pastor Mike Online, the article that I read where an evangelical Lutheran, probably a lesbianette pastor, telling people that it, God said it was okay if you watched ethically sourced pornography. Yes! You didn't watch... Listen. you got to watch PMO for this stuff, Melissa. Okay. But that's what she, that's what she come up with. That, and I'm going ethic, ethic, ethical and porn. They're, those two words don't, I didn't know you could say those two words in the same sentence. But that's, that's, that's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. The very thing that the Bible warns you about is happening in our lifetime. I mean, you go back 50, 60, 70 years in this country, you have liberals, but liberals are nowhere near going to that extreme as what is happening now right in front of our very eyes. And there is going to come a time when they will openly disobey God, think that they're pleasing God, and then they'll come after the Bible believers to persecute and to kill the Bible believers thinking that they're doing the will of God. Jason and I were talking last night about there are some people who really feel like that they are justified in subverting houses, subverting churches, sneaking in to a church, to a Bible-believing church, unaware sneaking in and subverting that pastor's authority in that church. There are some people who think that God tells them to do this. And I told him last night, I said, you know, I don't think that way. I never did. I never did think that in order to destroy a Catholic church, I should go in behind the scenes and pretend I'm Catholic and try to get everybody pulled out of that church by converting them to Christianity. I'm not a snake in the grass like that. Amen. But that's, that's how some people think. And uh, so anyway, we are, we are living in this time where Jezebel, Mystery Babylon the Great, Delilah, is succeeding in cutting off the seven spirits of God right out of the heart of the churches, right out of denominations, right out of minist ministries that used to take a stand years ago who no longer do that. But you have, jo you have uh, Samson here. In Judges 16, um, if you look in verse 26, Samson said unto the lad that held him by, he's had his eyes pull, pulled out, and he's had his uh, lock shaved off, but he did not was not aware that his hair started to grow back. Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars, whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Any t here's Samson. Picture Samson inside the temple of Dagon. And he has these Philistines on the roof above him. They are over him. They're, they're like, anytime you have something over something else in the Bible, it's showing dominion. Uh, Romans 7, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Death has dominion in this world right now. And so you have 3,000 men. Think about in heaven right now, there's a, there's a group of angels that are going to be thrown out of heaven so they can be destroyed. And what, what was the number of angels that are going to be cast out of heaven. A third. So with that, when you see the 3,000 here that are above, that are on the roof there of that temple, I think that represents the heavenly realm and it represents those angels. And Samson is going to bring down principalities and, and authorities. He's going to do it, how? With his death. 
So look at it, what it says in verse 28. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood. By the way, do you know that the, he the Bible says the heavens are supported by pillars. The Bible talks about the pillars of heaven. Let me just kind of get into that a little bit. You go out here, you look up, you see all these clouds up there. How heavy is water? If you've ever had to carry a bucket of it, you know it is heavy. Very, very heavy. So how is it that all of that water is being held up in that layer of the atmosphere? How is that 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 works? The Bible talks about the pillars of the heavens or the pillars that support that. And essentially what that is meteorologically is air pressure. In other words, the air pressure is what keeps that water suspended and all it takes is a low air pressure system to come by and all that water drops out of the heavens. So here is Samson and he's got the two pillars in his hand, his arms like this. And he says, verse 30, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Think of Christ making a show of his enemies openly while he is on the cross. Remember, he is there. He has taken the crown of thorns. That represents our sin that reigns over us, death reigning over us. He has taken on our shame because they've disrobed him. Uh, he has the stripes on his back. And he's taken the curses that should have been ours. And he's taken them on himself. And he's taken the curse of sin and the curse of death on himself so that in his death, he destroys him who had the power of death. So in this particular story, Samson is going to commit his greatest act of valor ever as a soldier. Some say, I've had people say, well, you know, Samson committed suicide. No, this is not suicide. Not in the sense, if you're a soldier and you're going to offer up your life to protect your fellow soldiers or to protect your country, that is not suicide. You're not dying by your own hand. You're going to fight with the last breath and then you're going to pull the grenade pin and just hold on to it till your enemies come up to you and shoot you. Then you blow them up when you die. And that's what Samson is doing here. He's not committing suicide. He is fighting the last best battle of his life. And that's what he said. He said, let me die with the Philistines. And if you look at this verse, he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead, well, look at this. So the dead, which he slew at his death, were more than they which he slew in his life. We know there's at least 3,000 people up on the roof. That doesn't mention the number of people that are inside the temple when he brings that down. But it can be truly said that in his death, he killed more of the Philistines, who are the enemies, than at any one time that he ever did in his life. But in order to do that, he had to die. In order to do that, he had to die. And our nation is full of stories of great men. Not, and not just soldiers, firefighters, first responders, police officers, who go in harm's way to stop a threat or to bring people to safety and in giving their own life for the sake of others commit great acts of valor. And uh, to me, those are the true heroes. Amen. Amen. But that's what Samson's doing here. He, the, the, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. 
So think of Christ now on the cross, and he's taking our reproach. He's taking the curse that was laid upon his head in the form of the crown of thorns. He's taking the scourging. He's taking the shame that belonged to us, and he took that on himself. And in his death, he is destroying the one who has the power of death. I like that. Amen? Amen. So this is how... So what I'm saying is, how is the devil overthrown? How are all the principalities and powers destroyed? How are they overthrown? How can they be defeated? They're defeated at the cross. And nothing else but the cross. Amen? I am a... I have been, have become, and will always be a firm believer in the cross alone for our salvation. If it's not the cross, it's nothing. There's nothing that can save us outside of the, of the sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ on that cross. Nothing else can. Amen? Turn to, uh, let's see here, we talked about that. Um, go to Joshua chapter 10. Here's another, this is one of my favorite stories. I'll never forget the first time I read this with a little bit of understanding. And buddy, I tell you what, I wanted to shout all over the world. Joshua 10. Joshua 10 is... Where Joshua is, he's already asked, commanded actually, the sun to stand still, the moon to stand still. Because he is defeating his enemies. He does not want the sun to go down before he's done with the job. And so, the, the five kings that he is chasing after have taken and hid themselves in a cave. Hoping that they would not be found. Well, Joshua's men find those five kings. Why are there five? Um, what's in Genesis 5? You have the lineage given from Adam all the way down through Noah. And that's where you start seeing people dying. Genesis 5, Adam dies. Seth dies, Enos dies, um, Methuselah dies, Lamech dies. The two exceptions are Enoch, he doesn't die, and Noah. And the fifth time Noah's mentioned, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He doesn't die either. But in Genesis 5, you have this pattern repeated over and over, where they're mentioned five times and they die. The law. Moses wrote how many books? Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul said that death reigned from Adam, who dies in the fifth chapter of the Bible. His name's mentioned five times. And you have Mo death reigned from Adam to Moses. Moses, who dies in the fifth book of the Bible. And so that number five represents death and the curse of death. Satan, who has the power of death, is mentioned in your Bible 55 times exactly. 55 times. So you have, you have all these, this number means something. So they had the five kings that represent the last enemy that is to be destroyed. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when you look in the Bible, you go through the book of Revelation, you see how true that is. All of the enemies are destroyed and then death truly is the last enemy to destroy because the Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's where they're destroyed. And as of that point, no one dies ever again. I hate death. When somebody that we love dies, it's, it's almost like we just want to die with them. It hurts so bad. Uh, watching Sterling last night with his chest pains, Lisa was very worried. I mean, she loves her daddy. She loves her daddy. And I could see by her face what it was she was worried about. Now, he's doing much better this morning, 
And praise the Lord for that. But the thought of her losing her mom and dad is not something that she's looking forward to. Okay? I hate death. I hate losing loved ones. I hate losing friends and church members to death. One of these days, the one who has the power over death is going to be destroyed because Christ has already defeated him. Okay? Think of, think of where you're going. One way or the other, you're going to a place where there's no death. Either through the translation, the rapture, or you may die before that happens, but you'll get over it. Amen? Amen. I wouldn't mind getting over death. Amen? Amen. But anyway, you have to, here's, this picture here is a prefiguring and a foreshadowing of the cross. So Joshua chapter 10, verse 22, those five kings represent their enemies. And I think in, in this case, they represent death. Then, Josh, then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel... And he said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. Which one of you fellows here ever played the game where you, you piled up on some poor kid and when you were sitting on top of him, you were the victor? Because you were on him. You ever played that? There's variations of it. King of the hill or... Throw, we used to throw a football up in the air and whoever dared to catch it, we'd chase them forever until we could cream them. Okay? But there's just very different variations of that. But when you're standing on somebody's head, you're in charge. Okay? They just can't get up from that. So Joshua... Here, Joshua is a type of Jesus. Jesus calls us, his mighty captains, he calls us together and he says, let me show you how I'm going to do this. You come and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So that's what they did. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. Verse 25, and Joshua said unto them, fear not, nor be dismayed. How many times, you're, how many times are you told in the Bible, fear not, fear not, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. Because with me, it takes a lot to convince me to not be afraid. Because I'm a big, scaredy cat. Don't say amen to that, Jason. You don't know me. But I am. I'm a big chicken. I am. Okay? I, listen, I get, I get pretty scared pretty easily. But I believe that there always comes a time... In a man's life, when God just gets all in him and he says, you know what? I'm not scared today. That has to come from the Lord. Uh, I read a story one time, and I believe it. This guy was uh, driving around in town, and he drove past this liquor store in town. And next thing you know, a guy comes running out of that liquor store with a grocery sack in his hand. And he jumps in this guy's car and puts a gun to his head. And he says, take off now. And this guy had just robbed that liquor store. And the guy sitting behind the wheel was a Bible-believing Christian. And that guy had that gun to his head and he said, get me out of this place right now. And the guy said, no. And the guy said, I'll blow your brains out. He said, no, you won't. He said, in fact... Not only am I not going to drive you to safety, I'm headed right over to the police station right now. And the guy said, I'll blow your brains out. He said, I just shot that clerk in there and stole a lot of the money. Do you think I'll think, hesitate for a minute to blow you away? He said, you're not going to do anything to me that God won't let you do. And I think God's telling me to take you right to the police station. And he headed toward the police station. Guy had to run out of his car. And I'm going, that ain't me. That is not me. But I just think, when God gets in you, 
you'll do what you've always decided you could never do. Okay? You can do it when God puts it in you. So anyway, fear not nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage for thus shall the Lord do, do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Your enemies are death. Your enemies are your, your own flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those are your enemies. And that's how God's going to, that's how God destroys them. He's going to put it in you to where you are not afraid of them anymore. Turn to, uh, hold your place there in Joshua 10 because we're going to come back to it. Turn to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I remember Melissa K. Stanley Jones preached this message 40 some odd years ago, and I remember it to this day. Never forget it as long as I live. And it didn't really set into me then what it really is now. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you have um, Jehoshaphat, who is king over Judah, and he finds out that the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the children of Mount Seir, who are the Edomites, they plan on launching an attack against Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat, if you look in verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Because you know what he realized? He can't beat them. He can't beat them. He cannot defeat three armies. Maybe one of them. Maybe on a good day, two of them. But he cannot defeat three armies coming against him all at once. And there's that number again. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You cannot, the, the reason why you had to get saved was because you could not defeat your own sins by yourself. And people try it. I tried it. People, and people are still trying it. They've been, they've been pumped full of positive reinforcement messages in their churches. So much so that they think that if just, they just think positive things all the time, that they'll just by their very act and by their very will, Conquer their own flesh and it never works. It's a setup for disaster is what it is. And I think the, de I do, I think the devil wants that stuff taught because he knows they are going to fail in it. And once he gets them down there in failure land, he can tell them, you don't, you don't need to be living for God anyway. You're the worst in the world at it. So, Josh that realizes that they can't do it. So they set aside a day of fasting and prayer. And so look at verse um, 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeal, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came uh, the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Well, look at this. Underline this in your Bible. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The cross belongs solely to Christ. Solely to Christ. Kenneth Copeland. I, I'd like to just pop his two front teeth out one of these days. Who says that God himself told Kenneth Copeland that Kenneth Copeland as a twice born man could have died on the cross for man's sins. I just want to pop him. Listen, he's not Jesus. I'd like for those devils to look at him and say, Peter, I know and Jesus, I know. Paul, I know and Jesus, I know, but who are you? But that's what he said. That cross belongs solely to Christ. He is the only one that could bear it. He's the only one. And so he says, this battle is not yours, but God's. And he meant that because he told the Israelites, he said, go get up on top of this hill over here. And he said, I want you to sing praises. And then I want you to watch what happens. The Bible says the next day, all three of those armies came down and God confused them. 
When they all met down at the, in the valley, they all thought that each other was the enemy, and they all started killing one another. And the Bible says that that battle did not end until the last two people stabbed each other. I would love to have seen that. And then all of a sudden now, all the enemies are dead, and God's people stood and did nothing except give God the praise and the glory, which is how it should be anyway. Okay? You fought the battle, and you've lost it every single time. And God is a jealous God. There's not room on the cross for Jesus and you hanging there for your own sins. Yes, we are told to take up our cross daily and follow Him, but that's just more of a personal sacrifice. It is not our own atoning for our own transgressions and our own sins. Catholic Church wants you to believe that, yes, Christ died for your sins, but some of that penalty must be paid by you, usually in the form of cold, hard cash, because they're going to bill you for it. Okay? You're going to have to pay up if you want that priest to forgive your sins. But that's just, that's how he's defeated. You're not, God, Christ is going to let you in on the defeat. But you're not the one defeating him. Christ already did. So back in Joshua chapter 10, verse 26. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. What is it about someone hanging on a tree? What does the Bible say about that? Cursed. cursed. Is anyone that hangeth from a tree? Does that mean Christ was cursed? For us. The curse that should have been, the reproaches that should have fallen upon us, fell upon Christ. And He took them out of the way, nailing them to His cross. The devil has already been defeated. It's already happened. Because Christ, when he comes back, he's not going to rehang himself on the cross again to beat him that second time. He's already beat him. Okay? It, who in here plays chess? A couple of you people. Your kind. I learned how to play chess, and I played it just long enough to know that I wasn't smart enough to beat most people. Because I'm the, huh? Yeah, because I'm the kind of guy, you, you take my queen in three moves, I'm going to turn the board over. Okay? And I'm going to throw the pieces across the room. But when you get somebody in checkmate, and you say, checkmate, it may take them five or ten minutes to figure out that you're not lying. Because they'll sit there and go, uh, maybe not. Uh huh. And then you go, no, I can't do that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, right here. No, I can't do that one either. And after a while, you finally realize he beat me. So consider the devil already beaten. He just hasn't realized it yet. Just hasn't realized it yet. I can't remember the place in the Bible. There's a story in the Bible where, uh, Ben hated. And the 32 kings, that's 33. How old was Christ on the cross? 30, his 33 kings, they go to war against Israel up on a mountain, on a hill. And they get beat. So they come back and they drink themselves drunk and they say, uh, yeah, their gods must be the god of the hills, but I, I bet you they're not the god of the valleys. So they decided to go back and try it again, only this time in the valley. See, the first battle was held at Mount Moriah, the hill called Calvary. And he got beat there. The second battle is called the Valley of Armageddon, in a valley. And they're going to get beat there too. And that's what happened. And that story was, they said, well, their God's the God of the hills, but not God of the valleys. So we'll just try to beat them in the valley. And they met them in the valley and they still got beat. I just, I, li I like this Bible. I like these stories that tell you 
how all of this thing is going to go down. And it's going to go down. And it's not good, going to be good for the devil. Amen. Amen. So afterward, Joshua smote them, slew them, hanged them on five trees. They were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to, that's exactly how long Jesus hung on the cross. Came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded and they took them down off the trees. That's what they did to Jesus and cast them into the cave. That's what they did to Jesus wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth. That's what they did to Jesus, which remain until this very day. That's not what happened with Jesus. Because three days later, that stone rolls away. He has already put down all principalities and powers making a show of his enemies openly, nailing them to his cross. So Romans 16, turn there. This is, I, man, I like this. Amen. Romans 16. God's going to let you get in on it. The first, since some of our guys are out deer hunting, the first, the first time Matthew killed a deer, He caught, I could see his deer blind up on top of a hill and I heard him shoot. And I thought, I wonder if he hit something. Directly my phone rang. Dad, I think I killed a deer. I said, okay. He said, oh, I'm shaking so bad. I said, yeah, that's what happened. So I said, don't move. I said, can you see him? He said, I think I see him laying down. I said, okay, don't move. So I waited about 15, 20 minutes, and finally I started up the hill. We got up to the hill, and I could see it laying down in the grass. And every now and then, he'd raise his head up a little bit. Okay? So I, I knew he was wounded, but he wasn't quite dead. So we eased over to him. I said, okay now, Matthew. Pull your gun up, aim right for where you think his heart or his brain is going to be, and drop him. See, I could have finished him off for him, but I wanted him to know that that was his deer. Instead of daddy doing it, well, daddy had to gut him, okay? But he got the joy of killing him, okay? And, I, and I, I liked that. I wanted him to have that thrill. So Christ doesn't need us, per se, but he includes us in the victories. Because after all, when Jesus withstood the devil after 40 days in the wilderness, I mean... He's God, right? God understands that we've had to fight him every day of our life. And there have been days when it seems like the devil is the one who's winning most of the battles here. I mean, that's kind of what it feels like, does it not? That he's getting all the victories here. So here's what I think is going to happen. That's, this is what Joshua was doing. Come, come. Put your feet on the necks of these kings. I want you to know the thrill of this victory Amen. that we're going to win together. Amen. He doesn't have to use us, but he chooses to. Because we've been fighting this devil every day of our life. And there are days I would love to take the devil and rip his seven heads off one by one. So Romans 16, verse 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. And I'm glad, therefore, on your behalf, but, I, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. You know what that, is, that means? That means read your Bible more than you read anything else. Okay? Be, it, you know, as, as a watchman, having a watchman ministry, I have to look into some things that I may not necessarily want to look into. I have a very large collection of books on Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, the occult arts, things like that. People send me these things, so on. Some of them I don't even touch. Some of them I'll look at. 
I like to get them, Aaron's helping me scan them so that I can search them. Instead of having to read the whole stupid book, if one of them's talking about something, I can do a search through the PDF file. And that way I don't have to read the whole stupid thing, just read this little clip of it and use that. But I, I mean, I got a collection of them, but it's better for me to be more about the Word of God than it is just about what the devil's doing. Okay? And so, be wise unto that which is good, but simple concerning evil. If you're like some of the people who's, who say, Pastor Mike, we don't even own a computer. I tell them, good for you. Because you're probably better off without one. Okay? You don't need one. Okay? Just read your Bible and believe it and that, that'd be it. So anyway, verse 20, he said, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. How many toes do you have? I don't know what nuclear reactor you were born next to. How many toes do you have? Five? All together, Wayne. I saw Jan give you the answer, so don't. God of peace, Bruce Staten, under your feet. Ten is the number for dominion. When you put that on him, God is giving you the grace of finally having dominion over your enemies. That's going to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. That was the bell. Study. Um, here's your homework assignment for next week. Second, Second Corinthians 12, and then study, do you a study in the Bible of the heavens. Everything the Bible says about the heavens, the firmament, the heaven of heavens, what does that mean? What does it mean the Bible says the heaven of heavens? What does that mean? So we'll look into that next Sunday, all right? Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you, Lord, for this lesson. I thank you, God, for this Bible. Thank you, God, you didn't, you didn't have to use us. You didn't need us, but... God, it sure feels good when you give us the victory and you let us be in on it. Because God, I hate that devil. I hate him. I hate what he's done to me. I hate what he's done to my family. I hate what he's done to my friends. I hate what he's done to men in the ministry. I hate what he's done in churches. God, I can't wait for the day so that he is under our feet. Lord, what a day that will be. Thank you, God, for including us in the victory. He's defeated by the cross, but he's defeated under our feet. Thank you for that. Lord, may your name be praised and your word be magnified above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.